All right, YouTube, I've been asked by a rather large number of people in a short span of time to talk about the Kalergi plan, um, specifically Richard von Kaudenhov Kalergi. I don't know exactly how it's pronounced. It's somewhat arcane, one of those Germanic names. I don't quite understand it. Uh, his plan, he was a social activist long ago, uh, and his basic uh, formulaic plan called for a united Europe in which a non-homogenized population, that is, you know, people within their different obvious ethnic groups, uh, sort of got together under one banner, cooperated, and it was for, sort of an early wave form of what we see now, which is globalism. And people wanted me to compare that to the European Union. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Uh, there has to be some comparison, but there also has to be some contrast, because I think the, the original principle of his plan has been left behind. He, I believe, ultimately had benevolent notions in suggesting sort of the pan-European ideal. That is, oh, well, you know, we can eliminate, like, the war and, and stuff like that, and we can all live in peace. And it's all well and good. I've spoken before, I think, like, the, the pre-League of Nations sort of idea of the same thing, involving not just Europe, but also the U.S. and some of these other countries. I think the people that originally dreamed this up actually were benevolent. Their idea was, well, why don't we create a league, uh, a group, a union, an alliance of sorts that precludes us from having to fight one another again so that we can work on, oh, I don't know, build some roads and, and trains and try to uh, allow people a greater degree of freedom and wealth. Unfortunately, what happened is that fairly soon after these plans were concocted, they were co-opted by multinational corporations and by other subversive elements within the world at large. I wonder who that could be. Take some guesses. And these various groups said, oh, well, yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea because then we'd, we don't have to compete either. We can make a hell of a lot more money. We'll have a hell of a lot more power. It'll be easy to control the political structure. Part of it will be post-national. So then we, we just control that structure. It's much smaller and more central. It's at a, an upper tier. And at least to that extent, we can expend a fraction of the money to control things much more readily. And I think that the United States itself became intrinsic. The, the model that we see now, sort of westernized globalism at large, goes past the Kalergi stuff. That's a pan-European model. But it's far more than a pan-European model today. The, the difference is the EU approaches that sort of style, although it's become extremely onerous on the actual states that are participating to the point at which most of their laws now are made by a post-national authority. That's why nationalism is rising across Europe. They're approaching the 1930s right now. It's rising up because people are tired of having to pay through the nose for stuff that eh, really ultimately isn't working and is pissing away all their wealth. But it goes further. The United States became, at that time, a rather dominant, especially post-World War II, dominant political and military power. We've got NATO and all of these things. So they realized if they could just control U.S. policy and, and actually sort of apply themselves to American nationalism and American supremacy, you know, sort of get the public uh, worked up over, we must defeat communism, we must defeat the, some foreign group or f foreign ideology, make the Americans hyper-patriotic so they take the lead. Their economy grows, their military grows, they get so, so pumped full of uh, military steroids they become basically unstoppable. And then that weight, that political and military weight, can allow globalism to take hold, started in the United States essentially, and then exported to Europe and these other places through these various complicated alliances and business ventures. And that's exactly what happened. It was almost, it wasn't America-centric because, oh, well, the American model works, liberty, haha, -ha, hooray, you know, wealth and capitalism. It had nothing to do with that. The, U the U.S. began devolving away from capitalism around the same time and became a corporate model that it is today. It's an interventionist, oligarchic, corporatist system. It's no longer a free market. We haven't had a free market in a long time. We haven't had uh, uh, capitalism itself in, in quite some time, untempered at least. Uh, we're really closer to socialism than we are free market and free trade and things like that. You look at our free trade agreements for an example why. So it gets exported from that power block that's created here in the West and exported all over the Western world at large. Communism declines and it expands further. And 
that's where globalism comes from. The essential idea uh, was abandoned. The central original idea was let's work in peace. And it didn't actually quite work that way. If we look at the world today as part of this massive westernized block of nations, the globalism there is not used to increase peace. It's used to start proxy wars, usually over oil or something along those lines, or trade, uh, trade factors in. When we're looking at like uh, Obama supporting an up, up, uprising in Egypt. We're not looking really at oil. Egypt has less of that than a lot of its neighbors. We're looking at the Suez Canal. When we look at what's happening in Turkey, we're looking at the Bosphorus. We're not looking at oil sales or textile mills or something like that. It's about strategic location. It's part of the grand chessboard, which features right into it too. What they want to do is destroy what's left of the Eastern Bloc. And from an ideological standpoint, destroying those potentially warmongering competitors is good for the Western world, isn't it? It's great. Oh, well, we can take Matt off the table. We wouldn't have to have the nuclear standoff stuff. But the end result, unfortunately, under the, fir um, under the current form of globalism would be very negative for us because then there would no longer be any liberating force. It'd be one global block. Everyone would be a member of it. There'd be no escaping it. Uh, any rogue nation would get bitterly suppressed. Uh, any population revolting against... Uh, what would come to be corporate control of the whole world would be killed uh, any population they'd just be slaughtered there'd no longer be anyone to stand in their way of doing so the people of the world could rise up the corporatists would uh, essentially nuke the world uh, to maintain their control more or less and so globalism is evil it was started with benevolent intentions in its very early primitive form it was then taken and corrupted Oftentimes, when we look at human history, we see that good ideas are very quickly co-opted by those who realize that they can misuse them for their own, usually fiscal ends. Corporatists, oligarchists, the global you know, power structure that exists today, they do not have the best interest of any member state at hand. It's just like the immigration debate. So many people in the West are bogged down in saying, oh, these foreigners, they took our jobs or something like that, that they don't even realize that there's a totally uh, counterpart ideological argument to make against the same plans, which is you're just also destroying the third world. But people are so disunited that they don't even see that. They don't have a proper weapon to fight back against globalism because it's very easy for the media and these corporations to simply say, oh, well, you're racist or bigot or, or these evil nationalists or something like that. Essentially, we've got two choices going forward in the world. <clears throat> Here's my ideological concept. We will unite. It's just a case of, are we uniting against our will through corporate control and globalism, being forced uh, to do so and being constrained in our liberty in the process, uh, often with attendant proxy wars? Or will the people of the world simply begin working together, keep to themselves, leave one another alone, and preclude the necessity of globalism? It no longer have an argument to make for its own existence. The pan-national model could be broken down. People could finally work for their own benefit, um, not kill one another over some retarded resource that half the time they don't even technically need, um, not empower their governments to wage unlimited warfare, as so many nations have, um, and simply come to common understanding. I think the Internet is intrinsic in this, by the way. The ability to communicate with people across borders very easily, very efficiently and quickly, um, using the internet is a great advantage against globalism. That's why they're trying to crack down on some of this stuff. Again, look to the corporations that are involved. Almost all of them are multinational. They don't have any national loyalty to anybody. They'll screw third world workers. They'll screw Westerners too. They'll do the same thing to everybody. They try to screw them all because all they're in it for is money and power. And these groups are intrinsic. These are the ones that co-opted the entire system. When we look back, we're talking the Prescott Bush days. Anyone find it slightly odd that the same uh, corporate firms were selling to the Nazis and to the West at the same time, funding both sides of the war and enriching themselves? And then, Pre and then little Prescott, you know, granddaddy Bush, somehow gets himself involved with the business plot too to try to kill the president of the United States and install a fascist uh, system. Anyone find that odd? It's almost a little bit like maybe the Nazis did win. Maybe Operation Paperclip did cause infiltration. 
Maybe there was some long-standing secret there that the Western world and the communists alike both realized when they revealed these plans, when they gained access to that information. Oh, shit. Somebody here has the right idea. Oh, but we can't tell our populations that. What are we going to do about this? It's, all, it's almost uh, evidence of a grand conspiracy beyond human reckoning. Um, I may not go that far. I may boil it down more to, oh, and corporates, uh, corporate control tends to corrupt things. Big money in politics corrupts things. That's a no-brainer. There's no question about that. But people like Kalergi originally developed these ideas out of a sense of almost romanticism for the human ideal. Um, that is, they assumed the good of man, or at least of, of westernized human culture. They assumed that good, and in their and they were very naive. They believed that it was possible to create such a system uh, without it being corrupted. Now, they could have read some classics, realized power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and they would have abandoned their ideas. They would have become nationalists, essentially. They would have uh, <laughs> said, they would have looked and said, okay, we can have tolerance, but can't we do that with nations retaining sovereignty? Why do we need a post-national authority at the government level to do this? especially one likely to be usurped by corporate entities. They could have said that, and these corporations, they make money off of war. Why do you think they pit people against one another all the time? I know I sound a little bit like a liberal now, don't I? They've got fundamentally the right idea too. It's just the modern left no longer dislikes corporations as long as they shield themselves by pretending to be progressive. Oh yeah, Coca-Cola is proud to stand with gay rights. Yeah, because you think that you can increase sales by pretending that you have some deep-seated uh, moral reason for being in favor of gay rights. Not because you organically decided this is a social issue we want to push. It's all about sales. It's all about money. That's what these people are all about. And it's gone past that now into the realm of power. They've been corrupted even further. Originally, it may have been. Oh, centralized control. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. We can, we can sell our products so much further. And we can lean on these government because we'll have more money. We can lean on them, lower the tax rate and stuff like that. It's no accident, by the way, that that upper tax rate drops like a rock around that time on these business entities in the wake of World War II. It's, it's, no, uh, it, it's no coincidence that that's when that happened in the U.S. and in you know the so-called capitalistic parts of Europe. They became corporate controlled. Not that the alternative was any better, by the way. The uh, sort of Warsaw Eastern Bloc operated much the same. We look at Mao, heavy centralization, attempts to build a power conglomerate amongst neighbors. We look at the USSR, cobbled together from these nations and controlling others, did the same thing, heavy centralization, um, a lot of industrial movements with significant political sway. It's uh, sort of like the doom of mankind because there's really nowhere to go to escape this unless you intend to live in a microstate that nobody cares about because it has no resources, you can kind of be left alone. Or some fringe state that's <laughs> reliant upon somebody else for its defense, maybe Iceland or something like that. Unless you go to one of these states, you're under globalism, including if you're outside of Western globalism. You think that like China and the states it works with, you think BRICS is any different? It's the same thing. They've taken up the same banner because the same corruptive forces are inevitably involved whenever there's significant power. That's why I argue for the reduction of government power and the dissolution of all global blocks. People keep to themselves, work for themselves, you have an actual free market with as little intervention as possible. The expanse of constitutionalist systems that are in turn more expansive than they were in the past, and you probably don't have this problem anymore. But unless you apply those constraints, it's clear globalism marches on. That's about all. Peace out.